8,850 meters, the mountain has stirred the imagination and courage of man for centuries. Hundreds have died trying to climb to its summit, and now a city slicker with a borrowed sleeping bag but a lot of heart is about to attempt to trek to its third base camp. This is the Everest Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Everest Podcast. My name is Eric and I am the host for this podcast series. Thanks for listening in. It is uh, day one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, about day six or seven, I've started to lose day six of my journey so far. I left earlier this Monday from California and now it's Saturday and I am now deep in Tibet in a town called Rong, Rongpu, R-O-N-G-P-H-U. It's already been a fantastic journey, as those of you who have been listening in uh, are well aware of. What I wanted to do today is, I mean, there's just so much to cover in this in this podcast episode. Some great things, just a highlight of what's to come that I'll be covering. I think I'm probably the first person ever in the history of of Buddhism to ever have pegged a Buddhist monk with a piece of bread while he was um, in prayer. But uh, (laughs) I'll get to that in a moment. Let me just begin by covering some of the highlights of the day. Uh, We basically left the town of Nyalam earlier this morning, early morning, and embarked on what was pretty much a a nine-hour off-roading ride from Nyalam to Rongpu, which is just just short of Everest Base Camp. Uh, It was a very long journey over rock and glacier, over streams. We had to ford a lot of these um, pretty wide brooks in our SUV, and it was a pretty bumpy ride. We had to turn off the Friendship Highway about halfway through our journey, and from there on in, the road pretty much was non-existent. So I'm, I'm kind of sore right now from the whole trip. (laughs) <laughs> I'm looking for a masseuse. I'm not sure if I'll find one here at the base of, of Everest, but uh, one can hope. But let me go over some of the highlights of this trip. We um, we had some pretty interesting sites along the way. One of them was uh, this monastery where a monk apparently holed himself up in a cave for three years, all alone in solitude, lived in a cave, tiny little cave, and basically meditated for three years on his own. And the story is is that he actually formed this cave by entering this very small little space. It was, you know, just a very small cave, and then pushed the rock up with his hands and uh, lifted basically the the rock or the, the the mountain above him to the point where he was able to lift the the height of the cave from maybe three feet to about uh, six feet high. Pretty unbelievable, and you know, one of those kinds of legends that you don't really think you can ever find yourself believing. But then you look at the rock and you can actually see, and the monks point this out, you can actually see where he placed his two hands. And I don't know, it just makes you start thinking whether or not you should be a believer or not sometimes when you actually see these things. And you feel the power of the monastery and you feel the power of uh, the religion that surrounds this this whole area. I don't know, it was just uh, it was a pretty moving experience. So that's definitely one pretty cool highlight. Another was actually our guide pointed out to us a high mountain pass in Tibet where even to this day Tibetans will actually use to flee Tibet and flee Tibet and enter Nepal so that they can try to go visit the Dalai Lama or pay their respect in India. But it's apparently just nearly impossible for any Tibetans to leave Tibet given the current rule of the Chinese government. And so Tibetans are forced to flee um, as refugees, and we actually saw this high mountain pass. It was a pretty jarring experience to see. I mean, first of all, the high mountain pass is is not at all an easy trek, (laughs) and it's even guarded by Chinese Chinese soldiers, so not an easy feat to get through this. 
Uh, but to know that even to this day, Tibetans do try to venture across this pass really just, I think, brings home, at least for me, the modern reality of what many Tibetans are going through even to this day. Just, uh, again, another pretty moving experience. With regards to our, our trekking and you know mountaineering, uh, today was a fantastic day because we actually ended up seeing four of the world's, uh, four of the 14 8,000 meter peaks in the world. Let me get that straight. So there are 14 mountains in the world that are over 8,000 meters high. I don't know if I said 8,000 feet earlier, but I meant meters. We saw four of them today. Two of them you will probably, you may recognize, Everest and Cho Oyu. The other two are lesser known, at least outside of the mountaineering world. One of them, and I'm going to butcher this name, but one of them is called Shishapangma. <laughs> it's, I think, the only 8,000 meter peak that's entirely contained within Tibet. And the other, the fourth peak that we saw was called Gyeongchenggang. So, unbelievable sights, especially Everest, knowing that that is the mountain that we're heading towards. That's the mountain that's the ultimate goal for our entire trip. And seeing Everest rise out of the clouds and really catching the first sight of Everest, at least from land, was just uh, was awesome. Just an awesome, awesome experience. And truly, you just see this mountain rising up beyond the clouds, and we were able to see the summit of the mountain. You can already feel the power of the mountain from from even this far away. So, uh, you know, all in all, the day has already been going fantastic. Surprisingly, we were, you know, so we were basically traveling from Nyalam, which is 12,300 uh, feet, to ultimately Rongpu, which is 16,434 feet. So an ascent of over 4,000 feet. Uh, even at 15 or 16,000 feet on our journey, it was hot outside. Not hot, hot like, you know, you want to go to the beach, but when the wind wasn't blowing, it was hot. We had to be in short sleeves. I was wearing jeans, but I wish I were wearing shorts. Um, so I guess it was kind of like beach weather. And mostly because uh, of the sun. I mean, I guess when we're this high up, we're, you're directly in the path of the sun. And you could feel as soon as you step out of the car or even in the car through the window, just the, the immense <laughs> power of the sun baking your skin. We, and we were baking inside the Jeep. We were we were heating up, <laughs> you, and you just wouldn't expect it this high up in the world. But apparently later on at night, uh, it gets ridiculously cold. And of course, we're now here in this land during more of their, I guess, towards the end of their summertime. So obviously in winter, everything's very different. This place is probably blanketed in snow. But for the meantime, it was pretty warm, and we were pretty shocked by that. So... You know, our journey lasted for about almost nine hours. Arrived in Rongpu, we arrived at our <clears throat> our new lodging for the day, this Chinese guest house, right next to the highest monastery in the world. The guest house was actually pretty nice, much much nicer than the guest house I was staying in in Yalem. There was uh, it was relatively clean, it was bright. I had a window in my room this time, which is awesome as opposed to in Yalem where I did have a window but that looked into the hall. <laughs> in this case, my window looks right out onto Mount Everest. Who would have thought that such a luxurious, quote-unquote luxurious hotel could exist in such a remote location in the world? But apparently it does. So the, the lodging here is fantastic. The views are to die for. Absolutely no complaints so far. The trip's been fantastic. But this is where my experience for the day gets really interesting, really cool, and hopefully you'll be entertained by this. Once we arrived in Rongpu, we settled in and decided to go for just a little mini trek just to get our, our muscles muscles going, our, our blood flowing, and getting a little more used to the high altitude and start the process of acclimatizing to you know 16,434 feet. So what we decided to do was hike to the nearby monastery, and once we got there, I wasn't actually quite sure if we could enter, so you know, I, I cautiously stepped in. My my travel companions decided to move on and, and just trek a nearby nearby hill. 
I decided to go in and was drawn to the inner sanctum of the monastery where 14 monks were inside doing their chant and reciting their prayers. It, it was a pretty dark inner sanctum. The walls were adorned with these very colorful Buddhist paintings and wall hangings. It was fantastic. So I decided to actually, I just sat down just outside of the doorway, um, through the open doorway, and to listen in. You know, the monks could see me, I could see them. And after just a few couple, uh, just a couple minutes, uh, one of the monks gestured to me, and he held up a small potato. <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but he motioned that he was going to toss me the potato. So I stood up, he tossed me the potato, and, and just as I was sitting down, a monk behind me came out of nowhere and motioned that I should actually step into the inner sanctum. Now, I wasn't quite sure what was going on. I wasn't sure if this was uh, a ploy for me to, uh, quote unquote, voluntarily give some sort of donation. But, you know, I thought, well, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm on an adventure. I might as well be adventurous. So uh, I took off my shoes and I, I left them outside. And I stepped into the inner sanctum and it was pretty dark, a little damp. A monk inside next to the wall uh, motioned me to come over and, and sort of uh, clear a space for me to sit down next to her. And so I did. I sat next down to her and another monk to my to my left, sat, and for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, sat there just sin letting the whole chant sink in, just letting it flow around me. And I'm not a, so much a religious person, but uh, for as much as a, a non-religious person can say, it was a pretty religious experience, I guess. The monks would, would chant in their low, deep, rhythmic tone, and every so often would play some instruments, again in rhythm, in beautiful sync and harmony, and then return back to their chant. And this would sort of alternate back and forth, and I, and I uh, listened to this for about 20 minutes, until all of a sudden, <laughs> the monk sitting in front of me, who was playing the, who, who was, I guess, the drummer guy, playing this big bass drum, used his drumstick and, and sort of shoved my backpack, which is on the floor in front of me at my feet. I was sitting cross-legged, and he just sort of shoved it a little bit playfully. And I, I looked up at him, kind of shocked a little bit, and he smiled, and he went back to drumming. And then about uh, a minute later, he, he turned and, and shoved my backpack again, <laughs> I guess trying to provoke me. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do, but the monk to my left apparently did know what to do. So she, she handed me a piece of her, her roti, this flatbread that they were they were munching on, just a small piece. And then she she signaled that I should should throw this piece of bread at the monk. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I, um, I I chucked it, and with my bad aim, instead of hitting him, well, I don't know if it was bad or good aim, but it hit him right in the shoulder, but it hit him at the back of his robes, and the monks wear pretty thick robes, so he didn't feel it, but it just sort of sat there on his robes for a little while, and the monk sitting next to me just cracked up laughing. <laughs> And then over time, the the monk uh, the monk who was drumming, and who I just pegged with a piece of roti, sort of shoved my bag in. So I, I motioned to the monk to my left. I said, "Give me another piece of bread," which she did voluntarily, just eagerly. And this time I chucked and I hit him. I hit the monk squarely in the back of the head, and uh, <laughs> he didn't turn around immediately. But when he did, I, I pretended that the, the piece of bread had just fallen from the ceiling. And he sort of shook his head, smiled, and went back to drumming. But then, from that point on, it was just it was just mischievous mischievousness uh, at its best. Uh, the monks across the way on the other side of the room quickly caught on to what was going and started giggling, and they started chucking pieces of potato. They were already pretty mischievous monks, I guess. They, they would uh, oftentimes, instead of playing their horns as they should have, would whistle really shrilly shrilly and sort of get chastised by the lead monk I guess but they were constantly causing trouble over there and, and giggling so uh, my antics over here on the other side of the room clearly weren't helping <laughs> it, it was just, <laughs> who would have thought that I would ever have the chance or the opportunity <laughs> to peg a monk in the back of the head while he was in prayer <laughs> never would have guessed 
uh, and I made fantastic friends in this. I guess I was in the in the monastery for close to an hour and a half, if not if not more than that. Just sitting there, let, letting the whole experience sink in, and every so often, I guess, chucking pieces of bread at these monks. But it was a fantastic time. But it gets better. After that, I all the monks the monks pretty much finished their chant at around mm, seven seven thirty or so. And as they were packing up, I actually took a few pictures with the monks, who I guess were now kind of like my friends, and they loved it. They they thought it was hilarious what what, what I was doing. And, but when I stepped out, I quickly discovered that my shoes, my sneakers, were gone. <laughs> the monks started laughing and uh, and told me that I should just go home in in some slippers that were also there, some rubber slippers. Clearly the original footwear that the uh, the thief had worn to the inner sanctum with and decided to leave behind since he had picked up my sneakers instead. So I was like, look, no, no, I need those sneakers. Please give them back. So one of the monks actually helped me track down the guilty monk, and he, he was hilarious. He he sort of pointed to, to my shoes, which were now on his feet, and he said, Oh, you want these back? And I said, yes, yes, I do. He said, oh, they're very comfortable. I said, yes, I know, but I need them. And after a, a friendly chat, after a friendly chat and actually a few photos, we we exchanged footwear. He wished me all the luck in, in climbing uh, to Base Camp 3, told me to be safe, and, and wished, me, uh, wished me happy journeys and uh, sent me off on my way. By the way, all of this took, pla- took, in, it took place in, in Mandarin Chinese, in my broken Chinese. I'm going to have to thank my parents when I get back for uh, teach me wh- teaching me what little Chinese I still remember <laughs> and was able to use on this trip. But what an amazing experience. What an amazing afternoon. Chucking a, a piece of bread at a monk while chanting and then, then having another monk jack my shoes and uh, as a gag. <laughs> really can't begin to explain just how strange an experience that really was uh, having just gone through it. Uh, it was interesting. So nevertheless, that was my day. Um, definitely very entertaining. Probably, no, definitely the best day so far on this trip, thanks to these monks. And before I just close out this podcast, I just wanted to uh, end with the traditional, the, the recurring segment that, that I'm doing now, which is the listen to Eric as he gets stupider segment. I've got the three tongue twisters that I'm going to repeat. And maybe you can begin to pick out some... Uh, some slips and a slightly slower speech, given that I'm now 4,000 feet higher than I was just yesterday. Uh, and here we go. Let's just get into it. I am a mother pheasant plucker. I pluck mother pheasants. I'm the best mother pheasant plucker that ever plucked a mother pheasant. I'm a mother pheasant plucker. I pluck mother pheasants. I'm the best mother pheasant pluck- plucker that ever plucked a mother pheasant. Oh, just a little slip there. Second tongue twister. Stan Lilhowski's little sister is a syphilitic thistle sifter. Stan Lilhowski's little sister is a syphilitic thistle sifter. And the third tongue twister, which I always screw up even at sea level. Blue glue gun, green glue gun, blue glue gun, green glue gun, blue glue gun, green glue gun. Ah, not bad. Not bad at all. We'll see what happens. So just a preview for tomorrow. Tomorrow we can actually get a slightly later start as we are hiking just a short ways, about a four-hour hike from Rongfu, where I am now to Everest Base Camp, and then the journey really begins. Well, I keep saying that, but then we're really on the trek. So we'll, we'll be at Everest Base Camp, which is 17,160 uh, feet. So we're going up just a little over 500, 500 feet. Not too bad, uh, but we'll take it easy. Uh, and given the terrain, it is about a four-hour hike. It is rather long. Then for the rest of the day, we'll just acclimatize. What we'll probably do is hike part of the way from Everest Base Camp, probably halfway up to Base Camp 1, just as part of the acclimatization process, uh, and then return back to Everest Base Camp, where we'll spend the night. So tonight is actually the last night where I'll stay in any kind of, uh, any kind of quote-unquote guest house or a hotel. Starting tomorrow, we'll be in tents. I'll have a cook. We'll be cooking our own food. Well, we'll have a cook cooking our food, but there'll be no more restaurants. And uh, then we'll really be roughing it. And for me, it it will be really rough. (laughs) I can guarantee you that. So until then, thanks for listening in. 
Uh, for more information on this trip, visit my website. Thanks again for listening in. Take care. For more information on Eric's Everest trek, as well as photos from his trip, please visit his website at www.everestpodcast.com.